Um, so my name is Chris Engelstad. I'll be talking about a couple of things. Number one is how can you get involved in clinical trials? How do we as researchers find you? How do you find the studies? One of the ways is to get involved and be registered with NAMDAC, which is the North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium. Uh, NAMDAC is both a patient contact registry and a biobank. So we keep information on you and how to get a hold of you if there's a clinical trial that we have that you might be eligible for. We'll keep information on uh, your disorder, your symptoms, genetic tests, laboratory tests, and those are yearly updated. So we have pretty good information in our database. Why do we keep this? We wanna find you when we have a clinical trial some, or some of the investigators wanna look at that information and study your disease a little bit more. It's very hard to do if we can't <clears throat> find the patients or don't have large numbers. As was mentioned before earlier today, many clinical trials um, need many patients and it's, it's difficult to find them and sometimes trials are underpopulated with patients. <clears throat> As I mentioned, NAMDEC is also <clears throat> a biorepository. We keep a blood sample. We have a virtual fibroblast log. And the investigators use these things. They may want to use your DNA to look at epigenetic factors, which are other factors that might impact your gene. They might look at proteins or various enzymes. So those are all held and they're available to investigators with NAMDAC, but also outside investigators. We do get the companies calling us and saying, you know, do you have patients such as such and so types? Do you have samples? What can we do to receive some of those? If you want to participate, currently you need to visit one of the NAMDAC centers, and I'll have a map on where those centers are. You would sign a consent form with a center. So if you've signed something online, it's not part of NAMDAC. You would have signed that in person with one of us who's working with NAMDAC. You can get information online about NAMDAC. The easiest way is just to go to Google and Google NAMDAC. Make sure you don't get the North American Missile Defense System. That's also on there, so if you sign something there, beware. <laughs> but you can get our contact, contact information on there. And I know a lot of people are not near one of these sites. Our sites are not all around the nation. I mean, they're all around the nation, but there's large areas where we don't have sites. Um, this is a map where each of the little stars indicates a site. And currently, you know, in NAMDEC, we're trying to figure out ways where we can enroll patients that are not able to get to these sites. So hopefully that will be up and running within about a year. But there's many investigators at the sites. Also, I know people have a hard time trying to find MitoDocs. This is a great way, place to go to find, your, to find a doctor, get contact information. You may need to travel if you're not near them. <clears throat> All of our data is held private in our database. You'll receive a unique identifying code number. Um, the data is released to the Rare Disease Clinical Research Network because we're being paid by the NIH and the RDCRN, the Rare Disease. But your name and information, your name, contact information will not be given to them. It's just to, so they can keep their own database. Um, so if on your consent form you can authorize whether or not your name and contact information is given to other investigators in NAMDEC. So if I consent somebody, somebody else from one of the sites has to, to and wants to get the information, they need to make sure that you've given your consent for it. So you'll receive a long consent form. <clears throat> so also it's very important to keep track of the studies that are on clinicaltrials.gov. This is run by the NIH, the FDA. All of the studies, or most of the studies that have gone through FDA approval to do the study are listed on clinicaltrials.gov. So watch that. You know, NAMDEC is not all the studies, but definitely keep track of what's going on in clinicaltrials.gov. So I'm gonna skip this, let me skip that. Um, one of the second things I wanted to talk about that many of you participated in is our surveys that we conducted for mitochondrial replacement therapy, and I wanted to kind of breeze through this. This was a study done in, with Dr. Michio Hirano. It's published. Um, the title is Attitudes Regarding Prevention of Mitochondrial DNA-Related Diseases Through Oocyte Mitochondrial Replacement Therapy. So a little bit about mitochondrial genetics. You all know there's hundreds of mitochondria in a cell. The mitochondria have mutated mitochondria as well as wild type. It's a condition known as heteroplasmy. Above a certain level of mutated mitochondrial level, a person will become symptomatic. 
All these mutations are maternally inherited, and the O sites in an individual vary in varying levels of mutation. So some people may um, have the mitochondrial disorder in the family, and other people may not because of the level, level of mutation. So people want to know about family planning. What can I do to, to try to prevent this in a family, in my simple, you know, off, offspring? And oftentimes people in the mitochondrial community, because there's not a lot available, just take a chance and hope for the best. Some people adopt, some people have no children. The nuclear testing or the prenatal testing that is available clinically is not really for the mitochondrial genome. It's not appropriate for that in most cases. Um, there are assisted reproductive technologies such as oocyte donation, zygote donation. There's lots of zygotes which are fertilized eggs sitting in freezers around the country, and oftentimes families will donate those if, if somebody wants to become pregnant and just doesn't have the money to go through that. <clears throat> There's um, also um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis for low heteroplasmy. Uh, levels that's not done so much in the United States. I, I know it's going on some in other countries, but not so much here. And then mitochondria replacement therapy. So mitochondria replacement therapy is really genome transfer. And again, this is not available for clinical use. We're, we are researching it in the United States and also in other places in the world too. But this is genome transfer. So step one, we take the nuclear nucleus out of the healthy donor from the IVF clinic, implant the nucleus from the mitomom, and then fertilize the egg. So in the media, you'll hear this as called three-parent DNA. So mitomom, dad, and then the um, donor, healthy donor. So we provided a survey before we got into too much research in the lab, which we have been doing. We created a survey called the Oocyte Mitochondria Replacement Carrier Survey, and we wanted to assess the level of concern for transmitting the mitochondrial DNA point mutations, the support for the development of this technique in the mitochondrial community, and the personal interest in using MRT as a family planning option. <clears throat> we also had a survey for the healthy donors that are donating in the IVF clinic, and we wanted to know their willingness to donate eggs for research for this for MRT. The eligibility was females at least 18 years of age. In the mitochondrial community, it was any known carrier or their maternal relatives, again, females at least 18. Everybody was provided a description of what MRT was, is. So our O site carrier survey, or the questions were, have you thought about not having a child because you were concerned about passing the mitomutation to them? Do you think that the project described is worthwhile important and worthwhile. If you have stored eggs, would you be interested in donating them for basic laboratory research to develop the technique? No viable zygote would be produced. And are you interested in becoming an egg donor? You would receive the hormone injections, then have an outpatient procedure to obtain the eggs. No viable zygote would be produced. So that's basic laboratory research. The next question was for women who were considering having children still or now in, or into the future. Are you considering having children now or in the future? How important is it that your children are your biological offspring? Is it not important, somewhat important, or very important? Would you be interested in using the technology to try to have a child? Would you be interested in allowing your eggs to be used for basic laboratory research in the process of developing an implantable zygote? And we, regarding the healthy donors in the, at the clinic, would you be willing to donate your eggs for basic laboratory research in which a viable zygote would not be produced, would you be willing to donate your eggs for the production of an implantable zygote that has the father and the carrier mother's nuclear DNA and your mitochondrial DNA? We recruited from many different places, and I wanted to thank Lissa, who was very instrumental in mobilizing the community here. She, we, we really needed additional mutations and additional patients in the study, and she was awesome in getting your community involved. And I want to thank everybody for getting, for getting, completing surveys and getting involved. So our healthy oocyte donors were um, from, again, the local <laughs> clinic. So we had um, 92 women who were mutation carriers or at risk of being a carrier. They were all 18 years of age. 
we had the three three of the top mutations in the LHON group, 20 from the 1178 and two from the 3460 and one from the 14484. So lots of 23 people in the survey are people from your community. So the results. 100% um, of participants understood that they could transmit the mutation to their offspring. 78% of women of childbearing age had thought about not having children because of transmission risk. 73% of women who had children prior to knowing they, were ca they carried or were at risk of carrying a mitochondrial mutation would have thought about not having children had they known of the risk. And 98% said the development of MRT was an important and worthwhile project. Of the 21 women who were considering having children, 52% said it was very important that they have their own biological offspring, 43% said it was somewhat important, and 5% said it was not important. And 90% 90, 90 of them said it, they would like to use MRT to have a child. And 78% said they're interested in allowing to, their eggs to be used for the basic laboratory research to develop this technique. So what about the O site, the Healthy O site donor survey? <clears throat> there were 112 women and 92% said they would donate for basic laboratory research in which viable zygotes are not produced, and 87% said that they would donate for the production of implantable zygotes. So among mutation positive and at-risk female carriers, there's widespread concern for transmitting these mutations. Realize that there's a lot of different mutations in our study, um, some with some less severe and some with very severe cases of um, disorders. There is overwhelming support for the development and clinical use of MRT, widespread interest in MRT among women considering having children, and among the healthy oocyte donors, the majority are willing to donate for research and the development of MRT as well as for clinical use. And these figures are very important because this information has really gone around the world. I mean, we spoke yesterday about this at the doctor's meeting. We've published this work. As you all know, the UK is also um, uh, available to do this or getting ready to do their clinical trials if they've not already started. So this is very important work. We have a long ways to go in actually getting this approved. So it's not approved for clinical use right now. Clinical use meaning if you want to have a child by this method, we can't do it at this point. So our FDA met with the public and with the investigators and actually got the Institute of Medicine to establish a committee to evaluate the ethical social and policy issues of MRT. And there was a 200-page report that came out this spring. And I'm not going to go over all of it because we would be here all day, but um, they did say that MRT was justifiable for serious mito diseases and if it's safe. It was justifiable to create a male offspring because male offspring at this point will not pass on their mitochondrial DNA to the next generation. So they're not eliminating the possibility of f female offspring, but right now they want to limit it just to male offspring. Regarding social issues, they said there were possible issues of identity, kinship, and ancestry, but that did not prohibit the initial investigations, and that they were really concerned about responsible use of human embryos. And some of their policy is to establish safety in preclinical studies prior to clinical investigations, to evaluate safety in children. If anybody born of MRT, they want long-term safety for these kids. These studies should only be at, stud at centers that have demonstrated experience in using MRT and to proceed very cautiously. So we at Columbia University have an IRB approved protocol for research in MRT, not for clinical use, but for research in going ahead to do the MRT and then we would freeze those zygotes. If in fact we do get FDA approval at some point, those could be taken out of the freezer and used. But again, it's not approved yet. So as you know, this is their work. They've done a lot of work on this in the UK as we have also. Um, they've received license and approvals through the House of Commons, House of Lords, that's the parliament. The public said it was it felt it was safe. Um, it should be done if it's safe and regulated. Their bioethics boards met about that, and they're in the process of um, starting clinical use trials. Um, Australia is also involved in trying to think about changing legislation so that MRT might be able to be used in Australia, and that's very important. Like I said, you're you're 
um, participation in our survey has really gone around the world. So thank you to everybody for doing that. And again, especially to Lisa, who has been so instrumental in, in having this done. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And as you can see, by collaborating between the LHON community and the UMDF community, we can work together. And by bringing our voice to the MITO community, we can enrich uh, the research that's done.